So um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Dr. Marian Allison and I'm the director of the CLD Standards Council. And I have been charged this afternoon with chairing this event. So first of all, I would like to thank everybody for their time, um, particularly on a Friday, um, when I know folk are sometimes thinking about um, the weekend ahead, um, and particularly this Friday, with all the, the new rules and regulations um, that we're, we're facing, certainly across um, large parts of the country. So thank you very much to everybody for doing that. So as I said, we have a, a very quick hour, um, and this really came about just purely because um, we were conscious that many CLD workers, practitioners from across the country in different um, places of practice have been working um, in really challenging conditions. And we thought it would be um, really helpful for people to take time out just to think about um, the guidance and what that looks like in practice. So I would really like to say thank you very much to everybody who submitted questions. Um, as you can appreciate, we had about 125 people signed up. Glad to see that there's 70 here. So that's the number of questions that we did get. So just to let you know that when we get to that part, that I, we did put them into kind of broad brush themes. And that was in and around the guidance, service delivery, um, resources, the future of CLD, and then there was just kind of some miscellaneous questions. So when we get to the question part, that's what that's going to look like. So this afternoon's agenda, very shortly, I am going to invite Dr. John Harden, who is the Deputy National Clinical Director with Public Health Scotland. Thank you very much, Dr. Harden, for coming along this afternoon. And he's going to give us 10 minutes um, of an overview of um, guidance, all things guidance, and what that looks like from a public health um, perspective. After Dr. Harden has finished speaking, I will briefly ask him some questions. Um, so please feel free to use the chat. Um, Nicola Sykes, who is with us today from Education Scotland, has very kindly agreed to keep an eye on the chat so that there's some live debate and there's Nicola giving us a wave. So please feel free um, to put any comments, questions, queries, wonders that you have in the chat room. So when Dr. Harden's finished, um, I'm going to pass over to Alicia Fisher, who is the CLD Policy Manager at Scottish Government. And Alicia is going to give us a walkthrough of the CLD um, guidance and what that looks like in the recovery um, phase, if we ever get to that, indeed. Um, next person up will be Nikki McCrimmon from Dundee City Council, who's going to look at what practice has been like um, in a local authority setting and give us an overview there. Then we'll have 15, 20 minutes um, from a question and answer sessions. And on our panel today, we have Marielle Bruce from Youth Link Scotland, Jackie Howey from Learning Link Scotland, um, and Mick Doyle from SCDC, Lisa Martin from Public Health Scotland, and Nikki McCrimmon, um, again, is going to um, help answer questions. So without any further ado, is everybody happy? If anybody's online, wave your hands in the air and I'll pass the ball over to Dr. Harden. Thank you, Trisha. Nice for some feedback. Dr. Harden, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marion. Uh, everyone, it's really nice to be with you today. I'm, I'm hopefully going to be able to, to uh, give you some useful insights uh, from my perspective. So, so I'm the, the Deputy National Clinical Director for Scottish Government. Um, I uh, unfortunately have the benefit of working and the, the commiseration of working with uh, Professor Leach. Um, so so um, uh, that's that's my parents, not anyone else's. Um, but as part of that kind of senior clinician team, we feed into the, the advice to ministers around all things to do from a public health perspective um, with relation to COVID and uh, beyond. Um, first thing I'd like to say is, sorry, it wasn't my fault. Um, regarding the, the the kind of level four restrictions that have just been uh, are just about to be introduced across uh, the central belt of Scotland, um, but I hope after I've spoken this morning or this afternoon, you'll understand why we've had to take those steps um, and the, the rationale behind them. So I think I'd just like to kick off by giving a bit of an overview of where we are in this whole pandemic business. Um, so so back in December, um, believe it or not, so it's almost a year that we've had this virus floating around the country or the world, um, first uh, starting off in China and then spreading throughout the rest of, of the world uh, over time. Um, generally, um, we probably started to see the first cases in February 
in Scotland. Um, and then we obviously had to take the more uh, uh, immediate steps uh, towards the end of March with the, the first wave uh, lockdown to try and stifle the, the spread of the virus. Um, and since then, you know the story. Um, you, you've seen the has come out of lockdown, you've seen us gradually try to ease those restrictions, but you've also seen how opportunistic this virus can be. You've seen how it takes the opportunity to reinfect people, to infect others, to spread its tentacles out and, and, and involve wider parts of the population. But during that time, science has moved on at an amazing pace. Medicine has moved on at an amazing pace. And in that time, I mean, I've been a doctor for 25 years nearly now, and I've never known medicine to be changing as rapidly as it has. I've never seen the NHS in my, my 20 odd years of being in and around it change so much so quickly to rise to meet the challenge that it did. Just to give you a bit of an example, I still practice clinically on a Thursday in my a &E department in Lanarkshire. Um, and I go there for a bit of respite from the government, which is quite nice. But I also go there to, to keep in contact with my clinical skills and, and, and expertise. And, and when I'm back in my clinical practice, I see those changes that's happened right up front. I see the benefits that happened. I see the treatments that we've now got to help us with the virus. I see the, the benefits of the new care plans that we've got to, to try and treat people at a different stage. And we're seeing less people getting admitted to intensive care. Um, we're seeing more people getting discharged um, from hospital after the effects of the virus. Unfortunately, we're still seeing deaths. I'm afraid to say we're still seeing deaths. But um, we're, we're doing a lot to try and um, kind of reduce those number of cases as much as we can. So what do we know now about the, the virus that we didn't know back in March, back in February? Well, we know how it spreads. It spreads by droplet spread. What does that mean? It means that um, small bits of spittle come out your mouth when you breathe. The virus is in those little droplets, and in the main, they fall to the ground. So if you're wearing a mask, the mask catches a vast majority of them. Now, we wear surgical masks, fluid-resistant surgical masks in clinical practice. They catch about 90% of it, okay? Um, when we're doing procedures that are more intense, where we are really tight-fitting masks, and they catch about 99% of it, okay? But your face coverings still catch a considerable amount, a, a proportion of it, um, roughly in the region about 50 to 60 percent of it so that's why it's important that wearing a mask is vital because it, it it stops that first line of transmission it catches the virus as it's coming out of you if you happen to have it your mask doesn't protect you though your face covering doesn't protect you you're wearing it to protect others from you and therefore you need to have that um altruism with each other and um, that that kind of shared responsibility with with yourself your your, your those you are working with those your colleagues and friends and family that they then wear a mask to protect you. Okay, so that's the important thing about wearing a mask. We also know that when the virus um, is in the atmosphere, in the air, after it comes out of your mouth or your nose, it does sometimes hang about a little bit um, in, a, in an aerosolized form. Now, in the main, that will eventually fall to ground or be blown away in the air. So that's why outside is okay. But that's why inside with poor ventilation or in confined spaces with lots of people, start to make it a bit harder and the virus starts to hang about a bit longer. So that's why we ask people to wear, um, wear the mask and open the windows when they're inside and increase that ventilation through, uh, through uh, flow um, so that the air is constantly moving and changing and so on and so forth. What else do we know? We know that the, vac the virus seems to affect those, of those at the top end of the age scale much more than it does those at the younger end. That's not to say it doesn't affect you. But we just know that people, as they get older, they get more uh, conditions associated with themselves. That, um, I mean, whose granny isn't on a box of tablets, you know, every day? So, so that's a sign that you've got more conditions building up in your system that impact on your ability to recover and respond to disease. And therefore, we see the more elderly population be more susceptible. We also see those people who um, have, have pre-existing conditions, such as the people that we asked to shield in the first half, um, uh, uh, we, they, they are more likely to have poor outcomes from it. But we even know more about that population now. And we actually, that's why the shielding guidance is different now. So in level four just now, we're not asking those people that shielded to lock themselves away in a cupboard. And we're asking them to live life as much as they can, but be extra cautious, to be mindful of when they go back to work. Are all the mitigations in place that they can do? When they're meeting with people that they 
they make sure they're wearing masks and keeping that two metre social distancing. Um, we also know about the, the, the kind of BAME communities. Um, and, and initially we were worried that there might be some genetic component. It's not there. That genetic component isn't there. It just seems to be that people who are in, in that BAME community tend to be slightly um, more likely to live in, 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 in conditions that are more crowded or, or closer family, multi-generational households that they tend to, uh, uh, in the main, and I'm, I'm generalising here, I'm not saying specifically, but, but in the main, they tend to have more public facing jobs, um, that kind of thing. So that seems to mean that their exposure is higher or their other wider risk factors are higher. And we also know that people in the lower socioeconomic classes seem to be affected more. So, so, so poverty um, seems to be a big issue. So, so people who are, who, are, who are on the poverty line or below the poverty line or who have got poor social housing or whatever, they struggle with this. Um, and, and it seems to affect them disproportionately as well. So, so whilst um, we talked previously about it being a leveller, there may be some instances where it actually widens that, equal, uh, that inequalities gap in some cases. Um, so it's just to have that in mind when you're, when you're thinking about the, the virus itself. What I'm essentially saying here, though, with all of that background, is that's why we've got facts. OK, that's why it's really important that you wear your face mask or your face covering. It's why you should avoid crowded spaces. It's why we need to clean our hands and our surfaces as we're directed to do that 20 second hand washing technique that I learned when I was a medical student still holds today. OK, 25 years later, in fact, I've had to go and be a refresher course for it to make, make sure I'm right. But it's really important that you wash your hands properly for the 20 seconds and that you wipe down all your surfaces as regular as you possibly can. Using general domestic cleaning products is absolutely fine. Some places want to go the whole fancy hog and buy all the expensive stuff, it's up to you. But keeping everything nice and clean and regularly wiped down is more important. Okay. Um, the the kind of other bits of, of facts are that two metre distancing. So trying to maintain that two metre distancing as much as you possibly can. And if you think you're at, you're, you're, you're at two metres, you probably aren't quite at two metres. So a wee extra step back. Okay, I find myself gravitating towards colleagues when I'm at work, and um, just because you're worried that they're not hearing you because it's noisy and you're wearing a mask. So just just be conscious of am I actually two meters and just over egg it and take an extra step back. And then ultimately, why we've got that whole thing about self isolating and getting a test when you think you've got symptoms is because we want to remove people who are positive from that community engagement. So you want to isolate yourself and then get a test to prove whether you've got the, got the virus or not. And it's vitally important that you adhere to that. That then feeds into when you are doing your job, when you're trying to deliver um, the services that you provide to those that you're, that, you're, that you're serving. And that's where that risk assessing is really important. When you're going to do a task or a job or a teaching episode or whatever it is you're involved in, a, a community group or whatever, risk assess it and say, can I do it bearing all that stuff that Harden's just spoken about in mind? Can I keep social distancing? Can we do it with masks on? Can we wash our hands? You know, and have I got a process so that I know somebody who might have symptoms doesn't come and self-isolates and go and get a test and all this kind of stuff. So have that risk assessment process in place and just, just take a moment to think about it um, before you jump in. I just want to talk a little bit about those pesky levels that we've just all put in place, okay? The five tier system that, that we've, we've talked a lot about. So we've just seen um, for the first time us use that level four um, close to lockdown uh, strategy across West Central Scotland and, 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 and some other areas. What that process is effectively trying to do is cut off that um, opportunistic type of, of action that the virus takes. OK, so I've talked a bit there about how the virus spreads, that, that kind of opportunistic action that it takes. So what the tiers do is as you go up the tiers from zero to, five, to four, um, we try to cut off the opportunities for the virus to spread. So we reduce the number of people you can mix with. We reduce the opportunities that you have of places to go where you might meet other people to spread the virus. and we also um, uh, put in those uh, other mitigations that prevent you travelling about and if you were positive, sharing the virus around. Okay, 
So that's why it's important that, that as you move up the levels, it's trying to cut off the opportunities that the virus has for spreading. And we've seen that, that we need to go to those levels where the virus is, is in high prevalence and it's not, get, not coming down because obviously the opportunities are too much for it to continue to spread within the community. Therefore, we need to back off and limit it. Whenever we make these decisions, we base them on um, the prevalence data around the, the, the virus activity and the impact it's going to have on the health service. But you may have also heard of a thing called the four harms. So the four harms that we talk about are the direct effects of COVID uh, on your health. So how many people are getting the, the virus, how many people are, are, are in hospital with the virus, and how many people are dying from the virus. Okay. The second harm is then that wider impact on health and social care services. Okay, so how are people accessing the services? What pressure is in the system because of the extra burden from COVID? So if we've got healthcare systems that have got lots of patients going into them from COVID, then um, they might not be as able to do the normal services that they, they, would, that they would provide because of that. So that's the second harm. Is what's that other consequences that's happening, not because of COVID uh, directly, but on other bits of the system? And then the third harm is the social harms. How much harm are our, our um, actions taking on you being able to live your life and, and, and have, a, have a, a healthy and a good life as much as we possibly can? So are you able to mix with, with family and friends? Are you able to meet with the people you need to see? Are you keeping your own mental health up? Okay. And then the fourth harm is that economic harm. And we're all hearing lots of things about the, the impact on the economy, the impact on, 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 on the ability of businesses to, to, to continue trading. And that's always a concern of ours. And we always take into consideration those four harms as we make a decision around what levels people need, need to go in. Ultimately, the aim of the process is to save lives. Okay to protect our services, and I mean not just the NHS, but the NHS and the social care services so that they can cope with people. Um, and but, but we need to take into consideration that economic and social aspect there as well. Lastly, I just want to kind of uh, draw uh, a conclusion on, on or draw, come to conclusion around what the future might hold, okay? So what's the future going to hold? So you may have seen lots of kind of excitement about vaccines. Okay, and lots of excitement about the future and what vaccines allow us to do. Just a little word of caution. Yes, it's fantastic news that we're going to have vaccines and we're going to have vaccines that can provide what look like really high levels of effectiveness in the population. I would just a little word of caution there is that it's not over yet. Okay, when the vaccines come, there may be logistical issues with us being able to deliver them to people. There may be uh, issues about how long it takes us to deliver them to everybody that needs to get them and then beyond getting them to everyone else. OK, and then the last thing I would say is that these restrictions and this virus aren't going to wait any time soon. Therefore, even with a vaccine in place, there's going to be a lag time before we're able to remove any restrictions or all restrictions. Um, and then ultimately, this virus is going to be with us for a while. OK, flu's never going away. There's only been one disease that we've ever managed to eradicate, and that's smallpox. OK, so just bear that in mind. We thought we had measles licked. We thought we had polio licked. No, we didn't. OK, and we still don't. So just to have that in mind. Yes, it's fantastic news, and I really hope it will be fantastic news. But just to make you aware that, that we'll be living with this virus for a bit longer. And thanks for listening. Thanks very much, um, John. That was a really full overview um, and I think very um, expertly delivered in such a short period of time. I'm just conscious that um, there's obviously lots and lots of questions and many of the uh, comments that we've received have been pretty much round about face-to-face -face delivery. You know, when can we safely return to working with young people vulnerable adults, community groups, and what does that look like um, for the tier system? How does the tier system affect our face-to-face -face delivery? So, so I think the first thing I would say is that, that there's, there's 
quite a lot of knowledge around what the impacts are at different age groups. So, so young children tend not to get affected by the virus very much, and there's evidence to suggest that they might not spread it as much as well. So that younger age group is quite quite safe, and, and that's why you see different mitigations for preschool and primary school than what you do for secondary school pupils. I know that some of, 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 of the guys on here will be dealing with the next age up, so that bit that deals with the kind of upper end of the school age, yeah. And into to, to young adult, um, so that kind of under thirty, I call it young adult now. We've even um, got older um, adults too. <laughs> well, I know you do, I know you do, but I was I was trying to keep it to that younger adult thing first. <laughs> um, but that younger adult group and, and and kind of older teenager, younger adult group, they 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 are starting to get into that realm of of yes, they spread the virus, okay, they can transmit it to others, um, but they are less likely to have poorer outcomes if they get it. I say less likely, it's not impossible. Um, in my clinical practice, I have seen some people in their 20s really ill, okay? Um, so just to have that note of caution in the back of my mind, everybody, all the 20 year olds think they're invincible, they're not, okay? So, so just to have that in mind. Therefore, I think face-to-face -face, um, uh, approaches will be dependent on what level you're working within because there's clearly laid out mitigations within each of those levels. And because obviously the prevalence of virus in those communities is higher or lower depending on what level you're in. But ultimately the basics are there. So that face coverings and distancing and hand hygiene and, 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 and avoiding crowded spaces and opening the windows and all that kind of stuff. So if you can do all of that, then that's fantastic, right? But be mindful of whether it is sensible to do what you need, you want to do within the context of the overall mitigations that are required, depending on what level of the country you're in. So, so if it's really high prevalence, it might not be a good idea. If it's really low prevalence, it might actually be okay. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm conscious that I could sit here all day and ask you lots and lots of questions because um, I'm just looking at some of the chat, people asking about outdoor learning, people asking about plastic visors. and the Outdoor use is good. Gloves. Outdoor is good. Plastic visors, you need to have the mask on as well and the plastic visor. Fabulous. Gloves, any? Uh, gloves if you're touching body fluids. <laughs> I'm not planning to any time soon. There you go, see. <laughs> So glo gloves are available. The problem with gloves is people then don't wash their hands as much. Right. Okay. okay. That's and good. you touch your mouth and stuff with the gloves on, that's the problem. <laughs> Listen, Dr. Harden, all I can say is thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Um, I'm sure um, we'll get lots of feedback. Um, you're certainly welcome to stay and listen to the rest of the chat, um, but I can understand how busy your diary must be, but please feel welcome to join. We're generally, bit <laughs> we're generally quite a friendly bunch, community workers, yeah. we're quite a good friendly bunch overall. But if there's I'm anything else you need, then just give me a shout. We will do. You'll be sorry you made that offer. You'll be here every week now, running a clinic. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I'm now going to move on to our next speaker, which is Alicia. Um, so, Alicia, I'm going to throw the ball to you. So it's up to you to catch it. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Thanks very much, Marion. That was really interesting stuff from Dr. Harden. Um, so I'm, my name's Alicia Fisher, I work for the Scottish Government, I'm Senior Policy Officer for Community Learning Development Policy, which includes youth work, adult learning, ESO learning, and a whole range of community-based activity. So, a bit of background to the CLD guidance. The CLD guidance was developed and continues to be updated and refreshed in collaboration with partners and stakeholders from right across the CLD sector. In order to publish the guidance, it went through a, a really rigorous process. So after we gathered all the feedback from stakeholders and COSLA and trade unions, Health and Safety Executive, Health Protection Scotland and legal colleagues, we then forward that to ministers to say, are you happy with us? Is there anything you would like us to add? And then we go ahead and we publish the guidance. So what is the point of the guidance? Why did we do that? It was a lot of work at the time and continues to be a lot of work. Purpose of the guidance really, and very short and succinctly, is to help you, to, is to empower you 
the service providers, the practitioners to make really important decisions in your own local context. So I suppose following on from what Dr Harden was saying, a four harms assessment determined that CLD activity can take place for the purposes of work, education, training and the avoidance of harm. So the primary objective in producing the guidance is to reduce the transmission within communities when all of that work takes place and where it is important work. So the guidance isn't about the value of CLD on learners. I think everybody already knows the impact that CLD makes. And it's really important that we have that sort of context in there to help other service providers to understand the value and the impact that CLD services is having on maybe some of Scotland's most vulnerable people. It's also really important that the guidance is set out in a way that lets everyone involved in CLD know what their responsibilities are in relation to keeping everybody safe. That includes staff, volunteers, learners, keeping everybody as safe as possible in the services that they're trying to provide. So how would we use this guidance? The guidance should always be used alongside other relevant guidance. And that would include guidance such as unregulated children's services guidance, um, existing guidance for colleges, schools, local authorities, and very soon there'll be guidance published for uh, community centres reopening. I think that's maybe a, another sort of couple of weeks away, but I have seen a draft of that in recent days. As well as this, every part of the CLD sector has its own guidance. So if you think that YouthLink Scotland has guidance for youth work services, um, SCDC has guidance for community development, and currently in train as guidance for adult learning too. So every sector will have those sort of practical elements where the Scottish Government guidance is a broad overview and more health and safety focused on keeping everyone safe, the practice elements will be embedded within that sort of context for the sectors. The guidance should be used in conjunction with the coronavirus regulations, the Scottish Government's route map and the new strategic framework because there's a lot more information within that. Um, that will help. So if all of this information is used together, there is no one single, one size fits all, especially for CLD is concerned because it covers so much in terms of what we do. So what would be the key messages that I would give you? Um, the guidance is designed to help everybody to think about the services that they're providing. So what services are you providing and what are the impact of these services? on service users and on the wider community. I would say that first and foremost, a very cautious approach is always required in relation to the virus, no matter what service you're operating in relation to CLD. For example, just because you can start a service doesn't mean you should start a service. The guidance isn't a replacement for the decisions that have to be taken at a local level in the best interests of communities and learners. So I suppose an overview of that would be that the guidance is about helping you to consider the learning environment and the mitigations that can realistically be put in place, but being honest with yourself and other people about how the spread of the virus and the mitigation in place affects the services and the service users. And understanding whether the behaviour of service users will affect the mitigation that's being put in place. For example, will learners or activities have an impact on other service users within the premises? Will learners be able to understand the rules that are being put in place and the mitigations? And are they likely to adhere to those? And that's just three considerations. I'm, I'm sure there's many, many more depending on the context of the group that you're working with. So. We would ask everyone to adequately assess the risks to everybody involved. It's about knowing your service and the working environment and assessing the impact of the work and the importance of the activity. While recognising the social needs for young people and access to the likes of youth work services 
The guidance has been developed with stakeholders and measured to strike a balance between this and the household restrictions in order to avoid the harm presented to young people and their families through transmission of COVID-19. And it's the same for many things over CLD. I'm, I'm just using youth work as an example, primarily because I, I run a youth group. Um, and although it's very, very good to see the young people together, but that comes with a number of risks. And the young people have actually told me that they don't want to restart because one of them is extremely vulnerable and had a transplant. So we wouldn't want to put that person at risk. And the young people decided that for themselves. The most important message, um, I think, oops, something's kind of happened to my screen. Alicia, I'm going to have to ask you to finish up anyway. I'm just conscious of the time. So yeah, yeah. Get last final words just so um, we can move on. But I am conscious um, that um, Mark Meekins just asked in the chat if you could clarify, is there guidance for the reopening and safe use of community centres coming out in a couple of weeks? So yes. if you can just quickly answer that for Mark and then we can move on. That would be great. Thanks. Okay, the final word would be, if you're not sure what you're doing, stop, connect with your public health, your local public health and environmental services and seek advice if you're not sure what you're doing. And in answer to Matt's question, very, very short and very quickly, yes. Good. Well done. I like that. I like when there's a nice, happy, um, rounded ending there. So with that, Nikki, I'm going to pass the ball to you and ask you if you can share um, your experiences of service delivery from a local authority perspective um, from Dundee City Council. So, Nikki, I'm going to throw the ball to you. Hope you've got your good catching hands on. Go. Okay. Cheers, Marianne. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen to show a bit of a presentation. It's not particularly illuminating, but I mean, you can't see me reading off my notes. Um, just to say that, recognise that this is coming from a local authority perspective with all those um, kind of resources we have in a local authority to assist us with health and safety. And also, this is a lot of this is a judgment. We're all negotiating our way through kind of um, these turbulent times. And we've had to make some really difficult decisions and judgments here. So everything I'm saying here Maybe you make a different decision or it was wrong or it was right, but we're just going to give you a bit of a flavour of what we did in Dundee and hopefully uh, it will be of some use to you. So after the initial um, kind of reaction phase through the summer where CLD and Dundee were at the forefront of delivering like, emergency food parcels and medicine and things like that, we started to develop a CLD recovery plan. Uh, we undertook a series of community engagement exercises, some of which are still ongoing. Uh, to identify the issues that people have to make sure that they get their uh, voice heard and to evidence the need for our CLD recovery plan. So as a CLD service, we decided that our recovery plan needed to be able to mitigate harms and as such needed a blended approach of online, telephone, face-to-face -face support. Uh, that we needed safe, well-managed spaces to do this and they had to be safe both for staff and for participants. Uh, we put in a plan to use the CLD guidance to reopen community centres to deliver essential CLD services. Uh, our overriding criteria was what could be delivered within the guidance and about being clear about what social or health harm was being mitigated. So we needed to bring the community on board with this and for local management groups who are involved with the community centres to understand that it's not just enough that people want, together so, want to get together socially, and that's a really hard conversation to have for people, but to ask themselves kind of key questions. Is it mitigating poverty, isolation, uh, mental illness or mental poor health? Is there a learning element? You know, it's not just for, I say just because that isolation thing is really important, but it's not just for kind of leisure. It needs to be something that's really essential that we put on. So working very closely with our uh, health and safety colleagues in the council, we took a kind of three-pronged approach to this. So the first was places, the community centres themselves. Will they be safe for staff and users? The second one was the people. What protective measures were we going to put in place to ensure the well-being of both the staff and the users, especially given the vulnerability that many of our users have? And the third one was the provision itself. What activities are required to mitigate harm 
as I said, just opposed to people wanting to kind of come together. So the overarching tool we've used for all of this are uh, COVID risk assessments, which uh, have to be signed off by our health and safety advisor within the council. So working through the CLD guidance and the HSE guidance, we ensured the buildings were compliant. Uh, we did, you know, the practical things about redesigning the spaces to allow for social distance and flow of people through the building. We moved to pre-booked access only, both for delivery and any access needed for desk space. Groups and individuals are met at the door. Their staggered entry times are in place. All the rooms have got identified maximum room capacity. We've looked at ventilation, the use of shared space and toilets. Uh, Dundee City Council ensured that uh, we had sanitation stations installed and identified risk points throughout the building. And there's a system put in place for weekly PPE orders for the building as well. Uh, we identified maximum numbers in the building any one time and the maximum numbers in rooms. And that's at a greatly reduced capacity than what we were doing before. So, for example, before an ESOL class might have had 20, 24 people in it. Now we're talking six people. If we are doing ESOL face to face, a lot of that has moved to online. That's the other thing. We're only do we are doing some face to face, but only where there is no alternative. Uh, some, a lot of the youth work, adult learning, ESOL provision has all moved online where that's been possible. Uh, face covering guidance has uh, followed, track and trace is in place in every building, there's clear signage throughout the buildings to display and reinforce that and prior to opening for community access every staff member has to complete a COVID building induction and in turn complete this with the users uh, within their group. Uh, there's an enhanced cleaning regime in place and we've developed protocol for dealing with the identification uh, of a positive or suspected COVID case in a community centre. So all this was done in consultation with local management groups, local people, uh, trade union reps, and their health and safety reps within the council. So what we've done is we've kind of, the measures put in place for the operation of the buildings are key to help support people, but we also have additional measures in place uh, for staff as well. So um, for the aspects of work staff can do from home, this is still the default but I've also recognised that some staff are struggling with space and resources. I mean, some people are working off a laptop off their knee, uh, sitting on a couch at home. And, you know, it's a real concern uh, for us. So we have made some, again, greatly reduced capacities with all the health and safety stuff in place. We have made some staff offices uh, within community centres available for staff as well. Uh, we've put in place individual risk assessments for high risk individuals. Uh, and groups. Uh, so we're looking to do stuff like minimise travel uh, and the shared use of space by multiple groups. We've had some really difficult conversations with some of our groups as well. So for example, the, the bingo group who come in who are all over 70, while recognising that um, the social isolation aspect for them, we've just had to say no to that because the profile of the people who are coming in combined with where Dundee are at at the moment in level three, it just wouldn't be safe to have that um, level of provision in. But what we've done instead of that, as we've said to that bingo group, okay, so instead of 30 of you coming along, what we'll do is four or five of you will come along, can come along at a time. And we're going to, instead of giving you a bingo session, we're going to get somebody from our community health team to come in and discuss with you about how you can combat isolation or any kind of health issues. So there's a health element to it. There's a learning element to it but they are still getting to come in to get their cup of tea and see each other and kind of reducing that sort of isolation. So I think that idea that people just want to be together, that's been the hardest one for both staff and for community members. Uh, people are just desperate to return to being together and sometimes find it difficult to see the rationale for why it's not allowed. And then on the other hand, we've got other community reps who are so scared that they don't actually want to come back into buildings. So some of that community activity has kind of fallen off as well. So um, I guess in summary, what I would say is uh, we've mapped our provision out against the five COVID levels. So here's what we could do no matter. So we've done these at level zero to level five. Here's what we could do in each of those levels. So that's the sort of planning that we've done. Um, so if we've moved into level three, we've updated our risk assessments, moved some of our delivery online. The likes of LCPPs, community councils that we've designated is not absolutely essential. They're either online or they're not happening at the moment. Whereas some of the stuff that's around about um, youth work, adult learning, community food provision, uh, you know, food drop-ins, food banks and stuff, we're still doing work like that in a kind of face-to-face -face basis. 
So we shared our work with third sector colleagues across the city as well, and we've also supported some community projects in the third sector to open. And we've been very fortunate to be able to call on support from our environmental health colleagues and health and safety colleagues to kind of support with that. Uh, so while it has been and continues to be a challenge, we've kind of used the guidance to satisfy um, the Council's corporate oversight group that we have the permissions and measures in place to operate and do what we're doing. So it, it continues to be a balancing act uh, and we, we're all going to have to make judgments. I'd say the Scottish Government guidance, the CLD guidance has been extremely helpful but you're still going to need to make those judgments on the ground. And, you know, we continue to do it, but as we always do in CLD, with those, that kind of overarching aim of reducing inequalities and making sure that the needs of the people in the community come first. So I hope that was quick enough, Marion. Well done, Nikki. You are the only speaker that's come in two minutes under. Do you know, it's so fantastic and well well, well rounded off. Thank you very much. Um, I think what's coming across here from most of the speakers is the multifaceted aspects of our work and the decisions that everybody's having to face. Um, I think um, what we'll do now is move into the, the panel session. So, Nikki, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen at this point? Um, and I just noticed that Karen Mackay has put in the chat and that might be a good place to start the kind of Q&A session. Um, and I think I'm going to ask that question to Alicia, if you don't mind, Alicia. Um, basically, Karen's asking about level four guidance um, and adult education face-to-face -face sessions. Um, and basically the guidance saying that they are only necessary for tasks linked to qualifications and vulnerable adults. Depending on the perspectives, various people who use our services may come under the umbrella of vulnerable. Does this mean that each context must put a request to their own health and safety or public health team via the council? So Alicia and I'm just thinking, Nikki, you might be able to best kind of share some of your reflections if you don't mind. So Alicia first and then Nikki. So I would say adult learning in the context of CLD is permitted to take place as part of education in general. Now, with each level comes a higher level of caution, and we would certainly ask people at every level to have increased mitigations in place, including reducing those numbers. Um, my suggestion would be, if you are uncertain, to look at the CLD guidance, there is advice specifically for adult learning taking place and I would also use that in conjunction with the college guidance which was updated at the tail end of last week. Okay, thanks. Nikki, is there anything that you would like to add from your experience in Dundee? Well, just to say we are at level three and almost all of our adult learning is currently online, our ESOL and our adult learning is online. Um, we do have some, especially with more vulnerable groups or people less able to get online who have come in, but we are, uh, you know, it's social distance in very small groups. But we also, when we mapped out our level four, we would not be bringing people in uh, at level four. And again, this is our judgment. I'm not saying this is exactly what you're meant to do or not, but we decided at level four, we just couldn't bring learners in. Uh, but everything that we do needs a risk assessment and we've been supported by our health and safety colleagues to do that. Excellent, thank you. Um, Karen, thanks, I'm glad to see you. I hope that helps answer your questions there. Uh, I'm going to move on now because one of the kind of main questions that we were asked um, when we asked people to submit questions was in and about balancing that risks and planning for service delivery. So how best can we make sure that we are adequately balancing risks and planning for delivering our services? So I'm going to ask uh, Lisa Martin, uh, Public Health Scotland, if Lisa, if you would mind taking that question first, please. Hi, Marion. Can you guys see me okay? Yes. Yes, we can, I can see you. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, I think uh, just to introduce myself briefly, my name is Lisa Martin. I work for Public Health Scotland. Um, I sit within the community development portfolio and um, Myself and my colleague Mick Doyle from the Scottish Community Development Centre have co-produced a resource um, called the Support and Community Safety Resource. And that is um, advice and support that is predominantly aimed at the third sector, community organisations, volunteers, community networks. 
um, activists and so on. Many of the people who CLD practitioners will be supporting and will have been supporting throughout uh, the course of the pandemic. Um, just in relation to that question about balance and risk, it's a very difficult one, it's a tricky one, um, and I'll invite Mick to, to join and, and jump in on this as well. But um, I think what we've heard from the speakers already is that um, there is guidance there to underpin some of that decision making, but it's a balance between um, looking at the guidance and trying to find your way through what is appropriate and relevant to you, and then also thinking about that in the context that you are operating in, the context that your service is operating in, the context of the activities that you provide, but also where you are in the country, what the current level of uh, protection tier is, for example. So we just heard from Nikki about being in tier three and some of the things that they have and haven't been able to do, which will be very different to some of the central belt areas, for example, where in tier four, there is a much higher level of restriction and there are limitations around what people can and can't do. Um, what, what we've said in the Support and Community Safely resource is that you have to take everything into context, um, not just the actual service that you're providing, but we encourage people to think about the broader community as well and the impacts. It has to be underpinned ultimately by reducing the every opportunity, reducing the, the possibility of infection transmission. And that's ultimately what we're about, particularly at this critical time, as we heard from Dr. Harden, when uh, infection levels are rising, positive cases are rising, and that's resulted in us being in the situation that we are at the moment where we have different levels of restriction across across the country. But what I would say is, is that, um, echoing the point that uh, Alicia made, if people are uncertain at any point about whether they should or shouldn't be doing anything, we would advise you to stop. Um, within the Support and Community Safely resource and the conversations that we've had with community organisations and groups, um, in some cases we are just not recommending that people um, start anything beyond planning to reopen services and thinking about the planning stage because that's the critical point, putting in place and making sure that you've got those mitigations that Dr Harden was talking about around about um, risk assessing, um, the other mitigations around physical distancing, cleaning and disinfection, and uh, you know, supporting your staff and volunteers, making sure that you're going to be complying with some of those uh, key messages that are in the strategic framework. And that includes things like, you know, can you comply with the test and protect regulations? Do you know how to do that? Lots of community groups and organisations are also employers. So they've got responsibilities to think about you know, how they're supporting their staff and in particular their volunteers as well. So it's, it's back to that bit of if you're unsure, take a step back, uh, stop and think about the planning of it in the, in the first instance and seek advice. Look at the Support and Community Safely resource. I would strongly advise people to do that. What we do there is we distill down some of those key messages uh, we use the guidance that's there to underpin that, but what we also do is we try and break it down a little bit and give people some operational um, advice as to how they can put procedures in place. So we tackle particular things like how would you maybe put in a comprehensive, comprehensive cleaning and disinfection procedure? What can you do to support physical distancing? What are the requirements around face coverings and so on? So that resource gives practical advice and support um, but again, go back to your local health protection teams and go back and review the guidance that's in place as well. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I'm actually going to move on now. Um, I'm just conscious of time, um, 10 minutes to go, four questions out of 400 to try and cover. Um, so the next question was really quite straightforward, but again, there was a lot of concern just about um, resources and funding as there usually is. So the Quite a, a straightforward question, and again, Alicia, I'm going to come to you first. Is there funds available to um, help with the recovery, to deliver services and to help with recover? What funding is available? Alicia, can you give us an overview, please? Have we lost you, Alicia? Almost. <laughs> I have network problems this afternoon. No. So fun, funding available. Um, Scottish Government has released a range of funds in relation to COVID-19. We have the £350 
Communities Fund, which is supporting well-being and supporting communities, a whole lot of activity taking place across that. And that's recently been um, sort of topped up with another £27 million pound funding call under SEVO, which is open at the moment. They've released support for digital, financial support to local authorities, £100 million pound for education recovery, and part of that is a £3 million pound education recovery for youth work. Um, so in short, yes, um, I think the Scottish Government has produced quite a wide range to try and take into the context how people have been affected by the virus and how they will continue to be affected to help to try and restart things again. Brilliant. Okay, okay. thanks very much for that. Alicia, um, I'm going to move us on to the next question. How do CLD partnerships and Scottish Government plan to work together to address recovery in CLD? And um, in and around this question, there was a lot of issues raised about vulnerable learners. So I'm actually going to ask Marielle Bruce from YouthLink Scotland if she could answer first and then pass to Jackie Howie before again coming back to some of our colleagues in SG. So Marielle, I'm throwing the ball to you. Thanks, Marion. I'm catching it without looking because I've got um, dodgy uh, internet here this afternoon, so I'm just going to keep my, my camera on, so um, apologies for that. Um, so, uh, ensuring access to provision for vulnerable young people. Well, I think from a youth work perspective, the youth work sector has made a really good use of blended approaches. So when we went into lockdown, organisations were using you know, online and remote approaches to engage young people and their families, use social media to reach out, you know, uh, providing them with information, live sessions, and they've really continued that. So, you know, we have managed to engage young people who would not normally have engaged with youth work services because we've been using digital approaches. And even once youth work was able to begin face-to-face -face youth work, these online and, and digital approaches have continued. And I think especially for organisations in levels three and four, it's helping to um, get that balance between providing a service for all young people whilst also targeting the face-to-face -face work at young people who, who need it most. There's been a whole range of different approaches used you know, throughout the sector. So continuing that one-to-one -one support, doing walk and talk end of um, sessions, detached youth work approaches, um, outdoor learning, making really good use of outdoor learning. And, you know, I think it's obviously becoming more and more difficult, but we've seen youth work organisations at the centre of communities at the moment, you know, securing um, winter clothing um, kind of drops for, for families that really need it. But for us, what we're seeing is that partnership seems to be the key to providing services for the most vulnerable. So the sector really, you know, coming together, local authority CLD teams and third sector community-based organisations really working together to identify learners who are in most need of that face-to-face that -face support and to help them overcome some of the challenges where, you know, a community centre might not be open, but we might have a local third sector organisation who's got premises. So really kind of looking at how we can work collaboratively to make this work for learners. Brilliant. Thank you. Jackie Howie, is there anything that you would like to add to that, please? Uh, no, I won't add too much because of the time, Marion, but I would just say that there's some national partnerships as well that are supporting the sector. So the, the reference group that was put together to support the, the, the minister, um, Alan feeding into the minister, that developed the, the guidance is probably going to be an ongoing group to support the sector going forward. So, yeah, good work. Great, thank you very much. Um, and Alicia, just about how do CLD partnerships and Scottish Government plan to work together to address the recovery um, in CLD? Any comments? Just that obviously partnership has never been more important than it is just now and partnerships across government are taking place more and more in the context of CLD. So one of the things that we are doing at the moment is developing the CLD guidance note for the CLD plans that are being created next year. And we would fully expect all of this work from right across government to be reflected from within that. Great. Okay, okay. Um, I am just, there's one more question that before we do the um, roundup, I'm going to ask Mick Doyle. Mick, straightforward question. 
how best can we advise groups? Well, I put something in the chat just now, and it's related to the balance of risk, really. I think it's now in November 2020, I suppose my, my view would be that we know that risk is increasing. The rate, of, the rate of increase might be leveling out. We know that risk is increasing, and that's why so many of us are now in Tier 4. And I guess a big question that we would ask folk is, do you think that what you can do now is absolutely safe, or do you think that it's worth waiting a little longer and persevering with the online methods and the, uh, the other uh, non-face-to-face -face approaches, where you put a really systematic approach of thinking about risk in place. Section 13 of our Support and Community Safely uh, resource, which we are updating, but it currently asks a lot of kind of challenge questions to ask yourself, you know, about making sure that your, your approaches are robust, they're sustainable, um, and that they're systematic. Uh, and a lot of the things that make that up have already been said about thinking about whether people are vulnerable, whether places create vulnerability, and whether the actions of others create vulnerabilities. But at the moment, I think on balance, our kind of core message, and I know this is the same for Scottish, for SCVO at the minute in, the, uh, in their uh, work, is that you need to think really carefully before you would reopen anything at the moment, and you should be looking very carefully at anything that's currently open uh, in order to ensure that it's still safe. So we want to balance the four harms. We know that a lot of the actions that we do are really important for people's lives and that there's no way that anybody would say that they're not. But the one that can kill in the short term is the virus itself. And I think that needs to be the short term lens, certainly in the higher tier areas, and that everybody should be coming towards a process of risk assessment that is really robust. And for folk out with the public CLD sector, it's really important to uh, understand that people don't always have the resources that public sector colleagues do. It's harder for them to do that. So the more we can do to get good, strong, congruent messages across the guidance and give people the tools to make the guidance accessible to local folk organising their own activities, the better. That's great, Mick. Um, I'm conscious that that's us almost time up. We've got two minutes to go um, just before I ask our panellists for just one last word. Um, I would remind everybody that there's some more sessions next week that I've got a focus on youth work, adult learning and community development. So check out all the usual kind of social media outlets um, to keep the conversation going. Um, so just quickly, and you have one word because I will stop you. I will be absolutely brutal. Uh, I'm going to ask you all just to think of one word to shape what you think the next steps, what the, next, the future is going to be for us. Uh, in the next six weeks. So, Marielle, what's your word? Cautious. Cautious. Jackie Howie? Uh, equally cautious. I'm in level four area, so it's definitely supporting caution. Caution, caution. Uh, Mick Doyle? I think collaboration. I think we've got a bit to do to make sure we're pushing the same message. Right, more than one word. Oh, I think my word would be informed about trying to make sure it is as well informed as possible uh, when you're making decisions about how you deliver your service. Brilliant. Nikki, one word. Plan. Model for the different levels. Don't be reactive. Brilliant. So that's us bang on four o'clock, people. Thank you very much for taking your time. Your words, your takeaway words are cautious, collaboration, informed and plan. Um, lovely to see you all virtually and hear from you all virtually. Keep in touch, keep coming along to the seminars um, and keep up all the fabulous, fabulous work. I'm so proud to be part of the CLD sector. So hopefully speak to you all soon. Take care. Bye.